Hello, I'm Aaron. I'm on staff at LifePoint. And thanks for taking time to check out our X series. You're getting ready to hear one of the 10 best messages from the first 10 years at LifePoint. And I believe God's going to use it to speak to you in a powerful way today. Well, to understand this series, I would need to take you back to 2007. We launched a series called The Real F Word. It was the most offensive title that we've ever come up with. But it's all about forgiveness. It was all about forgiveness. Forgiveness is the real F word. And to understand this series, you, the, the very first week of this series, I had a park bench sitting over here on the side of the stage. And, and I came out with my dog, my chocolate lab, Jax. Now, I now have a yellow lab. Jax is no longer in our family. But nevertheless, very cute guy. And I tied him up to the bench. And as I tied up to the bench, I began preaching and everybody was, they couldn't listen to me because poor Jax was tied to the bench. He was leashed up and he was close to the edge of the stage and everybody's like, what if he jumps? What's going to happen? And it was all under control, but people were all edgy and there was this tremendous tension because of him being leashed up to this bench. And the point was this, the point of the series was about unleashing unforgiveness and how it's so unnatural for us to forgive people, that a lot of us are living life leashed up to something that we should have never been leashed to because we never learned how to deal with forgiveness. And so the whole idea of the dog being tied up was that's what a lot of us look like in life because we, we, we don't know how to deal with what we, what we do when people offend us or hurt us or say things about us. And, and the bottom line is, I mean, in this life, you will be offended. Jesus said that. I mean, raise your hand, and just for a minute, let's do a quick survey. Raise your hand if anybody has ever done something that offended you. Okay. Raise your hand if anyone has ever done something that hurt you, made you mad. Raise your hand if anybody has done something this week that made you mad. Raise your hand if the person that made you mad is sitting next to you. No, I'm just kidding. No, you said, look at you guys, suckers. <laughs> Spouses are like, yep. Love it. I love it. I love the honesty at LifePoint. You know, it happens. It happens. And here's what I, what I, what I, when I look back over my life and I realize you don't, have to, you don't have to live very long until you deal with some hurt. Like, like nobody survives this thing unscathed. We all deal with, with hurt. And, and when we get hurt, it, it's, it's like we have a choice. When somebody hurts us, it's like we have picked up a brick and we can either choose to refuse to carry it around and put it down or we... We take it and we file it away for later. We're going to get them back. We'll show them. We'll find a way to seek revenge. I mean, in life, you either better get really good at being bitter, get really good at revenge, or get really good at learning how to forgive because you're going to deal with it over and over and over in this life. You know, this, this brick right here. You know, I think about my life. I think about being a kid and I think about bullies. Anybody ever have bullies when you were a kid? You know, there was a kid in our neighborhood. He was a big old guy. And, and I, probably picked, I probably egged him on a little bit. But he bullied me more than I, than I picked on him. His name was Abraham Fadley. It's not my fault that Abraham Fadley smells so badly. <laughs> probably is. It is my fault. Not that he smells bad, but that I said that. But here's the deal. So, so he would do things to, to hurt me. And I remember when he would, I would... It was like I would grab onto that offense and I would file it away and I would look for an opportunity that I might be able to get even and I would begin to carry, carry that around. And for some of us, it's silly things like that, right? We, you were little and somebody said something and they didn't really mean it, but it seemed funny at the time. But honestly, in the long run, it really, really was offensive and hurtful. I mean, we say things when we're kids, right? And we're like, well, I don't really mean that. I mean, I'm rubber and you're glue. So whatever you say bounces off me and what? sticks to you. You said that, right? But isn't it true that those things don't always bounce? That they stick. And sometimes you wonder, you know, I wonder if what they said about me, is it really true? I mean, am I, am I really that weird? Am I the odd kid? Am I the smelly kid? Like, is, what, what did they really say? I mean, can, do I really, you know, may, maybe it's something not so silly. Maybe it's something from a parent. I mean, do I, do I, am I really not as good as my brother or my sister? Was I really a mistake? And all of a sudden, this hurt enters our life, and we're not sure what to do with it. And so we file it away. And we figure we'll find a way to get even or get back or settle the score. And maybe for some of us, it's not something from our childhood. Maybe it's more recent. Maybe it's a relationship that didn't work out and she broke up with us and, or broke up with me. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I got dumped one year the day after Valentine's. Who does that? Dump me the day before Valentine's, before I spent all my money on you. And you, you get upset and 
So you think about, you know, is it really, is there really something with me? Maybe it's, maybe it's not, maybe it's you, maybe I'll get you back. And we take that hurt and we file it away. Or maybe for some, maybe it's, maybe it's at our job. Maybe it's at the workplace. Maybe there was that promotion that you should have gotten, but somebody lied about you and they took credit for your idea and they got the promotion and you didn't and you, no, you, were, you can't even look at them. You can't even sit at the same lunch table. You were just, you're just plotting for the day that, that you get revenge and oh, it's gonna be so sweet. Revenge is gonna be so sweet. Or maybe it's a relationship, maybe, maybe it's a, your ex. Maybe things have, um, it's just a mess right now. And they said things, or maybe it's, maybe it's that friend of yours that isn't really a friend, but they posted that about you on the Facebook, and you can't believe, it. you know they were talking about you, even though they didn't name you, but you could read into it, and everybody else could, and your friends that they told their friends that they said this about you, you ever happened to you? And you're like, oh, just wait, wait till I get mine, wait till I get mine, and you just took it, and you filed it away, and zipped it up, and I don't know what your life looks like, but I can tell you this much. 39 years carries with it a lot of hurt and a lot of disgrace and a lot of regrets and a lot of baggage. And I know this much is true. I'm not the only one in this room that is carried around unforgiveness. So I wanted this message to be crowd participation so that everybody can participate and experience the weight of unforgiveness, I've placed a brick underneath of your chair. So I want you to reach down, find a brick. They're slightly dirty. Uh, that's what happens when you buy bricks off Craigslist, all right? So they're under there. The dirt symbolizes the filth of life. Just look at it that way. But I want you to take that. Here's the deal. During this message, your job is to hold that brick. How you choose to hold that, there's some rules, all right? You do not rest this brick on your leg. That is not holding the brick. You do not dangle the brick down by your side. You hold the brick out in front of you. You hold it with a tense bicep. You're gonna get a bicep today at church. People are gonna be like, man, you look swole. You're gonna be like, I was at church working out, <laughs> pumping iron at church. That's what we do at Life Point, getting fit at church. So you can, your hold is out in front of you, okay? You can trade hands if you need to, but don't you go resting it on your leg. If I see you with it resting, I will call you out. You'll be on this stage doing push-ups. It's going to get ugly. So I want you to just hold this. I want you to hold this, and I want you to experience the weight of unforgiveness. And as we do, here's what I want us to do. I want us to take us to a passage in Matthew chapter 18 together. Matthew chapter 18, if you... Um, can with your free hand, get your Bible out. Otherwise, you can use your phone or just, I'm going to give you a pass on all that today. Then you can just follow along with me. But in Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus and he has, Peter's full of questions. Peter comes to Jesus and he asks this question. He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? That's a good question, right? That's a really good question. How many times? So if I am sinned against What's the rule? Like, how many times do I got to forgive somebody? See, the rabbis taught back then that you were required by law to forgive someone three times. So imagine I do something that offends you. I say, man, I'm so sorry. I never do it again. Will you forgive me? You say, yes. Then I do it again. And I come to you and go, I'm so sorry. Total mistake. My bad. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? I'll never do it again. And you say, all right, I forgive you. Second time. Then all of a sudden I do it again. And you'd be like, for real? Because you don't want to forgive me anymore, but the law says you have to forgive me. Now, if I come to you a fourth time, now what? Now, the law says you could just be like, sorry, Charlie, no forgiveness for you. It just, you know, cut me loose. But here's Peter going, Jesus, how many times? Up to seven times? You can hear in Peter's tone, like, this is very spiritual. He's like, watch this. Jesus is going to be so impressed with my answer. Up to seven times, and here's what Jesus says. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, some translations will say 70 times seven. A lot of people get caught up. Well, is it 77 times or is it 490? The point is, it's not about a minimum. It's not a number. So Jesus is like, you are way off. And to help you understand this, let me tell you a story. Jesus goes on, he says, he says, therefore... The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Can we all agree 10,000 bags of gold? That's a pretty good amount. 
All right, a bag of gold would be equivalent to 20 years' wages. You do the math, okay? 20 years' wages times 10,000 is a lot of money, okay? This is more than any of us, all of us combined, possess. That's the kind of debt that this guy has, and his number's up. The king calls his number, and so all of a sudden, now he's got to pay the debt. It's not a good day. Verse 25 says, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Give me, let me reset my debt for just a minute here. There we go. Verse 26, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. What a great story. Like, you could never pay me back. There's nothing you could ever do. I'm choosing to release you. You should be thrown in prison, but I'm going to set you free. Verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. This is about 100 days labor. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. Can you see him? Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Does this sound familiar? Begged him, please be patient with me. I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Dirty dog. Say, no, he didn't. Well, yeah, he did. He did. (laughs) Verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, rightfully so. And they went and they told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. And Jesus says, I want you to get this. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your what? From your heart. What's Jesus trying to say? Jesus said, Peter, I want you to understand something. Forgiveness is not about meeting some kind of a number. Here's what I want you to get. I want you to get this. And uh, here's what he's saying. He's saying unforgiveness affects everything. An unwillingness to forgive affects everything. How's that brick feeling right about? Everybody doing okay? Too easy, isn't it? I should have given you two bricks. All right, you're good. You're looking good. Unforgiveness affects everything. Think of it this way. Unforgiveness puts this man right back into the very prison that forgiveness freed him from. Think of that. This guy should have been thrown into prison, but forgiveness let him out. But unforgiveness threw him back in. Incredible. Incredible. See, I love this quote. I read this this week from Pastor Mark Driscoll. He says, where forgiveness stops flowing, life stops flourishing. Where there is forgiveness, there is life. Because unforgiveness affects everything. I want to talk to you today about the effects of unforgiveness and what unforgiveness affects. I would tell you to write this down, but you have a brick in your hand. Here's the first thing. Unforgiveness affects us emotionally. Emotionally. You will never be emotionally healthy unless you learn the art of forgiveness. Forgiveness is key to our emotional health. Job chapter 5 verse 2 says, resentment kills a fool. Now's a good time to nudge your neighbor. If they dozed off, just nudge him. Say, he's, he's talking to you right now. Just nudge him, and they'll look up and be like, what? Resentment kills a fool. An enemy and envy slays the simple. What is resentment? What does resentment mean? Resentment means to think again. To think again. To turn something over and over in the rotisserie of our mind. You ever stew on something? You're like, I can't believe that it is. They said that about me. They, I can't, they said that about me? Who do they think? Me? I tell you what, when I see them, have you ever just noticed how when you stew on something, something real little turns into something massive because you just kept turning it over and over and over? That's what happens when we resent. When we resent, we become miserable. And do you know what I want for you when I'm miserable? I want you to be miserable. 
You know the saying, misery loves company. If I ain't happy, I don't want anybody else to be happy. And if I'm not emotionally healthy, I will attack everybody else. I'll be in a ticking time bomb just waiting to go off. And some of us, you know people like that. You're like, oh, stay away from them. It's one of those days. And you know people like that because they don't know how to process. So suddenly somebody does something. Everything is offensive. Everything is an attack. They're a victim to everything because they don't know how to process and forgive. And so their emotions are just constantly revving and running. And if you have to deal with those kind of folks, let me just give you, you, know, give you a little something that I've learned. Don't look at the what. Look at the why. So often we're like, you know, we're so focused on what they said and what they, I can't believe they did, they did that. I can't believe they said that. Can I tell you, people that, that are lashing out towards you, it's not often what they're saying. It's, it, you need to look deeper. You need to look at why, why are they saying, why are they speaking like that? Why are they, why are they ignoring me like that? Why are, they sh- why are they trying to shut people out? Why are they overreacting? And here's what you're going to discover if you dig a little bit deeper. You're going to begin to find that hurting people, you know this, hurting people hurt people. It's just life. See, if I'm hurting, I want other people to be hurting. You know, these words came out of my mouth recently towards my daughter. My daughter, who's awesome, she's 13, and she came home from middle school, and she walked in the door, and as soon as the door shut, it was like like she just fell apart. Just started bawling like, I mean, I understand that she's 13 and she's a girl and she's got a right to that. It happens at a moment's notice, but it's not normal for her. So she just melted down. I'm like, Kenley, what's going on, baby? Talk to daddy. You know, what's, what's, what's up? And she, I can't believe that they would say that about it's a lunchtime and the girls. And I'm like, okay, I only caught like every fifth word, so I'm not really sure. Slow down, try it again. And as it turns out, there were some mean, just mean girls at school and Kenley was in their crosshairs that day. And of course, as a parent, moms and dads, what do you want to do when, when you find out somebody was being mean to your kid? You're like, my inner redneck just came out. It's like, oh, no, you didn't. Where? Where? I will whoop. Okay, I won't whoop. On record, scratch that. I will pray for them <laughs> by laying on of hands violently. I mean, you know moms and dads. You, you're like, no, you don't talk about my kid like that. And it's... it's and it's, I mean, I was, I was angry, and I'm trying to talk to her, and out of my mouth said this, Kelly, you need to know that hurting people hurt people, that the reason they're trying to hurt you is because somebody probably hurt them. And, and when you understand that, it helps you process people that are emotionally challenged, and they don't know how to handle this whole forgiveness world. And so instead of forgiving, they just hold on, and they, they, they aim that resentment towards innocent bystanders, and you got caught up in it because unforgiveness affects us emotionally emotionally. Here's the next thing I want you to see. Unforgiveness affects us relationally. Relationally. You will not have healthy relationships unless you learn to forgive. I don't know if anybody's married to someone difficult. Chances are you are because we're all a little difficult. You got to learn to forgive. You want a healthy marriage? You learn to forgive. You want to have great friendships? You learn to forgive. People will do you dirty. You've got to learn. How do I forgive? Unforgiveness, though, affects us relationally. Look at what Ephesians chapter 4 says. We're told to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Like, get that junk out of here. Somebody say, get that junk out of here. (laughs) Has no part in our life. We got to get rid of it. Instead, we're told to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. We're to be kind and compassionate and forgiving just, just as, this is what blows me away, just as in Christ, God forgave us. What in the world does that even look like? How, how were we forgiven? We were forgiven completely. We were forgiven. I mean, there was no aspect of forgiveness that was withheld from you and I. Before we ever were born, Jesus offered and extended forgiveness towards us. Towards us because he loves us. I call it preemptive forgiveness. He forgave us before we even did anything that needed forgiving. He's like, look, you're going to mess it up big time, so I'm going to forgive you on the front end. And quite honestly, those are the healthiest of relationships are the ones where I see people that are extending forgiveness. Lots of people say, you know what? 
you know, that's great and all, but I, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. Well, I don't know that I ever wake up feeling like forgiving people. I feel like running them over with my car sometimes, <laughs> just being honest. But here's the deal. Look, forgiveness isn't a feeling. It's a choice. It's a choice. I don't think Jesus were like, you know what I feel like today? I feel like a cross on my back. I feel like getting a crown of thorns. That's what I feel like. But he chose to be obedient towards his, towards his heavenly father. And here's the thing. In our relationships, if we don't get this, if we don't learn this, you're going to drag the mistakes and failures of this relationship right into the next one. You're going to pick up all the mess from a broken relationship and drag it into the next one. Some of us are unknowingly dragging our ex into our current relationship, wondering why it's such a mess. Because we never learn to deal with it. Watch out for people that run from relationship to relationship and never learn to say, I'm sorry, or I forgive you, or how to mend brokenness. Now, I'm not telling you you're going to walk back into an unhealthy situation, but you learn to forgive. You learn to forgive, and you don't let your feelings dictate what your life should look like. They affect us. Unforgiveness affects us relationally. Here's the next one. Unforgiveness affects us physically. There is a physical toll to bitterness and unforgiveness. And here's what I love about this. Science is just now beginning to figure this out, like something that the Bible has told us for a long time. I mean, if you look at Proverbs 1430, going back thousands of years, we're told that a heart at peace gives life to the body. But look at what envy does. Envy does what? Say it with me. It rots the bones. There are people rotting from the inside out. They look great on the outside, but on the inside, it's a, it's a hot mess, and things are all kinds of, you know, coming apart because they haven't learned how to deal with broken relationships. But a heart at peace gives life. Isn't that, we want life in our bodies, and, and even the smallest things have a way of getting infected. You could have the tiniest paper cut, and if it gets infected, oh, man, you could lose the whole finger. How many of us have lost parts of our life because we were unwilling to deal with or to forgive. How's everybody doing with that brick? We doing okay? We doing okay? I see people doing curls. That's awesome. I saw somebody doing some tricep presses just a moment ago. This is good. This is good. This is a full body workout today. Full body. You guys start doing some air squats in a bit. Just kidding. Just stay in your seats. You're good. Here's, the th here's, the, here's what's cool. So science is just now discovering a lot of this stuff that the Bible told us a long time ago. It says this, giving up grudges, studies were done, it says giving up grudges can reduce chronic back pain. Huh? I mean, of course it reduces back pain. Look at this. Look what happens when you carry this. Can I tell you, this is heavy. This is very heavy. And for a lot of us, we've carried this and much more for years of our life. Wonder, man, why, why do I feel the way that I feel? Anybody here got back pain? Maybe you need to forgive somebody. It's because somebody's on your back. You know, get them off your back, forgive them. Listen to this. Forgiveness limited the relapses among women battling substance abuse problems. Instead of running to the substance, they learned to forgive. And by forgiving, they didn't need the substance. That's incredible. This was great. Letting go of a grudge can slash one's stress level by up to 50%. I'm 50% better. Well, who did you forgive today? <laughs> It's great. Stanford University did a, sh a, a study showing that forgiveness improves energy, mood, sleep quality, and overall physical vitality. It's like, man, you got more spring in your step. You bet I did. I dropped a whole backpack full of bricks and people that I had been bitter towards. Changes your life. But then the study goes on and it says, carrying around a load of bitterness and anger at how unfairly you were treated is very, very toxic. I think it's awesome that God's like, I'm glad you guys are figuring that out. I wrote it in a book a long time ago. But it, it affects us. It affects us physically, physically. Here's the last thing I'll share with you. Unforgiveness affects us spiritually. Spiritually, you will not have a healthy, vibrant, growing relationship with God if your relationship with people are broken. You will not have a healthy relationship with God if you are unwilling to extend forgiveness in your relationship with other people. Listen to what Jesus says. He tells us that if you stand praying and if you hold anything against anyone, that's strong right there, 
anything against anyone. Say it with me. Anything against anyone. Let's do it again. Anything against anyone. But hold on, Pastor. What if it's somebody from like a long time ago? Anything against anyone. Anyone, but you don't understand what they said to me was so her anything against anyone. But this is somebody that you know, anything against anyone. But it, it was something so big, anything against you get it, anyone. If you are if you come to church and you're worshiping, you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your father in heaven may forgive your sins. Wow, that's big time. That means that if I am unwilling to forgive those that have wronged me, my relationship with God is hindered and I am not going to grow. You ever wonder, why is it that I feel like my prayer is never leaving the room? I get, try to read the word, but I'm not getting anything. It just seems like, you know, words on a page and I'm trying to pray and it's just nothing's really clicking. Could it be? Could it be that your relationship with God is at a lid because you are not dealing with the people that you need to deal with? You need to begin to extend forgiveness. I mean, we're literally, this passage is like, if you're standing here praying and you're worshiping Jesus and you realize I got a brother or a sister that I need to forgive, like stop what you're doing, go deal with them and then come back. I mean, could you imagine what if we actually practice that in church? We'd all be singing and halfway through the worship set, like all of us would leave, go make it right, then come back and, you know, then we'd have a whole lot better church service. We'd probably have a revival breakout. I mean, it'd be powerful. But it's a big, big deal if you hold anything against anyone, anything, forgive so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. Hold on, Pastor. Does this mean if I don't forgive, I won't be forgiven? Here's the deal. You need to understand, like, Nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. All right? Nobody will come and snatch away your relationship with God. Okay, So if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, nothing's going to change that, that you are now saved, you will spend eternity in heaven. What you will suffer is a healthy relationship here and now. It's like this. On May 15, 2001, my oldest son, Riley, was born. The day he entered this world, he became my son, and nothing will ever change that. Now, we have a phenomenal relationship. We enjoy, we laugh, we go, we go to Chick-fil-A. He loves Buffalo Wild Wings. I mean, we, we spend time together. It's a great relationship. And I pray that it will always be that way. But let's say someday he just decides he's done with his old man. He knows better. What do I know? I'm just an old fuddy-duddy and says some ugly things. And we get in a fight and he goes one way and I go the other and we never mend. Will he still be my son? Yes. Will we enjoy the relationship that we currently enjoy? No. It will be strained. And that's where a lot of people are at in their relationship with God. Your relationship is strained with God because you have been unwilling to forgive those that are around you, that have hurt you. And I'm telling you, you weren't created to live that way. Unforgiveness affects us spiritually, spiritually. Put another way in Colossians chapter 3, we're told to bear with each other. That means put up with one another. There's some people in your life that God put in your life just to teach you how to put up with people. Some of you are in this room. God said, I put them in your church so you learn to put up with them. I love you. Love you. All of you. Bear with. Put up with. You got some people in your life you just got to put up with. And forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. I look at this brick as a whatever. As a whatever. What grievance have you been hanging on to? And maybe you don't want to forgive. You're like, I don't want to forgive because I'm going to get even. I'm just waiting for the right moment. Waiting for the right moment. And you're just waiting and you're unwilling to forgive and you're unwilling to let them go. Have you ever heard the saying that withholding forgiveness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die? See, here's the thing. We, we, we refuse to forgive somebody because if I forgive them, I'm letting them go. They're, they're going to go on and live their life. I don't want them to live their life. Hey, newsflash, they are living their life. You're the one stuck holding on to something you should have never been holding on to. So make a decision today that you're going to forgive. 
You're going to quit carrying this around. Is everybody getting, everybody getting a little tired? A little tired? Some of you still holding it out there? All right, a little bit. I see a little bit of fatigue. Okay, should have gotten you heavier bricks. You're stronger than the other crowds. You guys are good. But here's, we, we weren't created to hang on to this weight. Unforgiveness is a weight that we were not designed to carry. And for many, we have held on to that whatever for far too long. And you hold on to it long enough, you begin to think that is your lot in life. And I'll tell you, you were not designed to carry it. Your, your shoulders weren't strong enough. Your back's not strong enough. Your legs will give out in time. And what we got to do is we in fear how to say, God, you know what? I'm sick and tired of carrying this mess. I can't because I was never intended to carry it. That I'm going to take the, the weight of life and the burden that has been on me. And I'm going to finally say, God, I can't. I'm giving it all to you. That's really heavy. <laughs> can I tell you how freeing it is? Go, go ahead and take, take your bricks. Put it back under your chair. You, you can put it down now. Put it down. It's, it's a little freeing, isn't it? Does it feel good to... Some of you, I mean, you're, you're like, wow, I got a bicep after that. That was... Can I count that as a workout? <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it? To let that go. I may feel a little bit tiring. You may have like... You may get T-Rex arms from holding that thing. Oh, it's incredible when you let go and you drop a weight you were never intended to carry. And you realize this is what life is supposed to be like. There's a freedom in Christ. We're told to forgive whatever grievance and to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, this became so real just being in Israel this past, uh, this past trip. Being able to walk where Jesus walked and we, we walked the Via Dolorosa which took us through the, just the steps of Jesus. And we, we were at Caiaphas' house where Jesus would have been arrested and denied by Peter. and He would have been whipped and beaten. And then over to Pilate's Praetorium, which is where the guards would have taken him and they would have begun the process of mocking him. They made a game out of it. They made a game out of mocking Jesus. And they would roll dice. And if the dice said that he's beaten, they would beat him. If the dice said they put a crown of thorns on his head, they rammed a thorn crown of thorns on his head and they would put a purple robe of mocking him just they leave it on his back just long enough for the blood to begin to congeal and they'd rip it back off and, I mean this is the way that they treated him they tortured him and they carried the cross to Golgotha to the place of the skull and they drove the spikes into his wrists and into his feet and they hung him there to be mocked and spit on and lied about and and then when he's on the cross do you know what he said you know what he had the audacity to say? He looked at his tormentors and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I guarantee you it pales in comparison to what Jesus did. And we're told to forgive as the Lord forgave you. Can I tell you, he withheld nothing. He knew that you would double-cross him again, but he forgave you anyway. I don't know what your situation is, and people often say, but Pastor, you don't know the, the deal that I went through, and I, look, I don't. I know what it's like to be a young kid and to watch your dad walk away from your family for three years. You feel abandoned. You blame yourself. You wonder what's so unlovable about you. That's what you think when you're a kid, and your parents are fighting, and one walks out. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be lied about, to be bullied in school, to not be picked first, second, or third for the teams. I know that. I know what it's like to be misunderstood. I know what it's like to have people take jabs at you online. I know what it's like to be the, you know, f you know to be publicly written. I, I get that, but I get your story is different than mine. I don't know yours and you don't know mine, but I, I know that my responsibility in life is to forgive those that have hurt me and offended me. And when I do that, what I'm doing is I'm saying, God, I'm letting this go. And I'm trusting that you are way better at revenge than I am. And so I'm gonna do what you've called me to. I'm gonna be obedient. And we do that, we grow in our relationship with God like never before. Because we're trusting him to handle something that we so desperately want to do in our own strength. And I just wanna encourage you today to simply ask yourself between you and the Lord, what is it, God, that you're asking me to let go of. I got to let it go.
Let it go. Let it go. Don't make, it's just, it, it was just the right moment. What do you need to let go of? Seriously, what do you need to let go of that you've been holding on to for far too long? And you realize, you know what? Man, I, can't, I can only carry that for so long until I break down under the pressure of it. Some of us are broken down today because we've been carrying something that we're never intended to carry. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for all that you've done, for the fact that we can forgive because we've been forgiven. And Lord, I pray that you would, you would remind us that you give us the strength to do what we can't. And so, Lord, I just ask for that today. For those, I know everybody here has probably got somebody. There's a conversation. There's a phone call that needs to happen. There's a cup of coffee that needs to be shared and needs to have a conversation, God. There's husbands and wives that need to sit down and talk, parents and teenagers. God, I pray that we would get really good at forgiving. Maybe today there's some stuff you're dealing with. I want to encourage you, when we dismiss, our care room is open, and our team would, be, would love to talk to you and pray with you. It's not easy. Forgiveness is much easier said than done. But for some today, you realize that you don't have a relationship with God. There's never been a surrender of your life asking Jesus to take over. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins and to change your life. You never made him the Lord and Savior of your life. And you're trying, the only option you have is to carry this stuff on your own. Without Jesus, you have no options. And I just want to encourage you today to make a commitment. I want to give you a chance to put your faith and trust in Jesus. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, would this be your moment where you do? Just in the quietness of this moment, would you make this your prayer? Just in the quietness of your heart, say, dear God, thank you for loving me. Tell him that. Thank you for loving me. I give you my life. I put my faith and trust in Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. I want to live for you. Say this, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me.